Awake living into uncharted territory. Together. Accelerating your wellness path. Plus, your interconnectivity at the same time. It's not your grandma's or your Veda, but it kind of is. It's the Yoga Healer Real Life Show with Kate Stillman. Okay, I'm really psyched that Donna Farhi is back on the show today. For those of you who don't know, she just released a brand new book called Pathways to a Centered Body. She co-authored it with Leela Stewart, and it's got some of the coolest illustrations. It's also the best book to be released on the inner body exploration of core yoga. In this interview today with Donna, you will learn how your psoas has everything to do with your moment-to-moment experience Whether you experience pain or pulsating bliss, you can trace the roots to your experience to the current state of your psoas. According to Donna, your psoas is your hidden treasure. Enjoy this show. It's a fun, it's really kind of a fun exploration of this six-step protocol that she and and Leela created uh, to help people really tap into the power of their psoases. Today's podcast is brought to you by Awake Living. If you are operating at a higher level of consciousness, if you know how to take care of your body, then you are eligible to apply for your free Awake Living coaching session at yogahealer.com forward slash awake. We're coaching peeps who want to optimize their time, hit their goals, up their game, refine relationship resonance, and expand their wealth. Check it out at yogahealer.com forward slash awake. This offer is time limited, so act now. Before we start the interview, I just want to give a quick update. I'm sitting here in my my Glam Palace office, my new house in Alta, Wyoming, looking at Grand Targhee, which is still covered with snow. There's greenery creeping down low. Today we're putting in about 10 trees into our our new yard. Uh, we've met the neighbors, had a little dinner party with the neighbors on Saturday night. It's been super fun. And what's amazing to me in this experience is I keep up leveling my experience of the five elements. And this is so much what the Awake Living course is all about. It's me transmitting these teachings. And this house is interesting. And Winston and I were just talking this morning, how it's like it, it up levels our vibration and it's so spatially resonant. It's, it's, an, it's truly an incredible experience. So That's just one of the five elements we work with in Awake Living is space. And it's truly amazing what can happen when your space pulls you and your better self forward into it. Uh, Anyways, if you want to check out that free training, it's at yogahealer.com forward slash awake, only available for a limited time. So if you're on the podcast and you're not on the newsletter, uh, you're probably not knowing about that this is going on and you should check it out. It's awesome. I I just had surgery and she was recommended for myofascial release. And then she said I could come to her yoga class and I had strapped crutches to my back and ride my bike because I could do that for my knee rehab. Oh, and I'd hobble in. Joan used to drive over the pass to come to the weekend intensives. And it was, yeah, it was a lovely, lovely era (laughs) for yoga. (laughs) Such a small world. Totally, totally. All right. Well, should we dive in? Okay, let's go. Here we go. Donna Farhi, author of Pathways to a Centered Body, co-author with Leela Stewart, Gentle Yoga Therapy for Core Stability, Healing Back Pain, and Moving with Ease. Donna, why don't you just first talk about why why this book now? Why this book now? Well, there's a little bit of a story behind it because uh, probably it was about six or seven years ago, uh, Leela, who's a colleague of mine in uh, north of Vancouver, Canada, she had been doing a lot of clinical work in her uh, practice with the SOAS with her students and she trains yoga therapists. And she had a handout that didn't even have uh, photographs or anything on it. And I began to experiment with many of the practices that she was offering her clients and students. And eventually I asked her if I could use the handout for uh, my intensives. And I rewrote a lot of the exercises because I'm a writer. And eventually I added photographs. And as I started 
integrating this work into yoga intensives worldwide, I was seeing some quite remarkable results. And a few years ago, I uh, went back to Leela and said, why don't we upgrade what at that point was a small handout into a small book? And that morphed into a much bigger project on the core body. And the, I mean, Leela has her own reasons for wanting to do this project, which I probably shouldn't speak to because I don't, I don't like to represent others per se. I know that she wants this work to reach as many people as possible because it's so beneficial for myself as someone traveling around the world and, and seeing a very diverse range of cultures and ages and people coming to intensives uh, who are practicing different methods and traditions, I've been seeing what I, what I would call a worldwide epidemic of hypermobility where people used to come to classes. When I first started teaching public classes, the main issue that people seemed to have was uh, stiffness in the body, a lack of mobility, and those sorts of issues were addressed really well with gentle alignment-based yoga. And at that time, I was more teaching from an Iyengar perspective. People would come with back problems caused by stiffness in their body or immobility, and, and they would receive tremendous benefit from doing yoga. Now, I tend to get people coming whose back problems and other uh, body issues are the consequence of their yoga practice. And what they tell me is the more yoga they do, the worse they get. <laughs> and that's of real concern to me because this is a healing modality. It shouldn't be a harming modality. And so I think the primary issue now is that people need to learn how to create more balanced stability to modulate uh, the flexibility that they're developing in their body. It's much harder to put on the brakes once you've uh, increase the range of motion through the body beyond a healthy point. It's much harder to go back than it is to develop that balance from the very beginning. Mm. So because there wasn't the the container of alignment and and just the knowledge or just the knowledge of the balance between stability and mobility, that leads to the hypermobility, which then makes it even harder to find that the deeper level of, of more conscious stability. That's kind of what I'm hearing. Is that, am I on the right well, track? The, yeah, the, the spine for just, if we just take the spine as yeah. an example, it's not a democratic structure. The spine isn't equally mobile from a structural point of view uh, uh, throughout the whole vertebral columns, some segments of the spine are naturally more mobile, some are naturally more stiff. And if you don't have an awareness of how you're opening your back, you'll become hypermobile in all the wrong places and you'll remain stiff in the places that you would really want to increase the mobility. And that was very much the case for me. I've probably had every kind of back problem you can imagine. Some of that is congenital. Now I've discovered over time that I had a congenital condition in my lower back and only fairly recently I've discovered I have a congenital condition in my neck. Uh, and I would say that dancing and doing really aggressive backbending in particular made my back a lot worse. So I've had to use this work to literally reconstruct my spine from the inside out. So the spine I have now is not the spine I had 20 years ago. I had a extremely hyperlordotic back. I'm sure Judith Lasseter can uh, confirm that. Very accentuated lumbar curve. I don't have that anymore. My back is a completely different shape from having increased the strength in my body and 
probably decreased my flexibility by about 300 percent. So there's a lot of poses I can't do anymore, but most of the time my back feels really good and I can do lots of things here on the farm that I probably couldn't have done 20 years ago without pain. Mm. It so speaks to the, like the integrity, like where we have integrity and strength where there's that, ah, okay, (laughs) need to rewire for deeper levels of capacity. Yes. And when you ask what the cause is, uh, I think there's enormous status right now uh, generated through being able to do very extreme virtuosic movements. Some of the movements I'm seeing on the internet make what we did 10, 15 years ago look utterly pedestrian. They're so extreme. Yeah. And there's status to be gained in that. There's not... There's not a lot of people who are going to take a photograph of themselves sitting in beautiful meditation posture. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to see a Buddhist calendar, uh, January to December, of beautiful sitting posture, beautiful, simple, elegant experience of having that integrity in the body. So we've very much objectified what we think yoga is and made that representative of of the practice, whereas what we're really searching for is a much deeper expression of what it means um, to be to be centered. So let's dive right into to that into the the six step protocol that that you two have have codified and in how that depth brings us right into the deeper or the the hidden treasure. I love how you call it the hidden treasure of the the soas and. And how it is, it's it's hard, it can be hard to find, right? Like yeah, it's, and it can be. So when most people think of the core, I say, look, I'll go back. Culturally, when people think of the core, often that's synonymous with I've gained weight and I'd like to have a trim waist again. If, if we're honest, that's why a lot of people go to do core classes is they're hoping that they'll be able to get rid of their tummy. But when we think of core, what most people think of is the abdomen and specifically the front of the abdomen. So if you imagine the abdomen as a bowl, certainly the deepest layer of the front of the abdomen is tremendously important, the transverse abdominus muscles for core integrity. But the deepest abdominal muscles are in the back of the body and that's how they're classified uh, anatomically, the psoas muscles are like industrial strength columns either side of the lumbar vertebrae. They go all the way up to the last thoracic vertebra. And those deep, very large, might add, muscles go all the way from the spine. They bridge the pelvis and then attach to the lesser trochanters of the hips, which is sort of the inside of your thighs. So if people run down their hands to like the inner seam of their yoga pants and then go in an inch or two, those muscles are connecting the spine to the legs. And if those muscles are tight or unbalanced, they literally throw the whole pelvis and spine off balance, off center. So if you start with core work and core strengthening before you've balanced those muscles, you're going to strengthen your imbalance. You're going to strengthen yourself into your off-centered position. So the, the reasoning behind the protocol is let's work with the deepest level of core first by First of all, finding it. So I think it's very important for people to be able to visualize and have some cognitive understanding of their their anatomy. And the second step of the protocol is softening and hydrating. And and that's quite different than stretching. It's bringing new fluid into the tissue. And if your psoas muscles have been off balance, what will happen is the weight loading, which should be going through your skeleton, the bones goes through your psoas and the psoas says, okay, if, if you're going to ask me to 
act like the skeleton, I'll become like the skeleton in the psoas literally can feel as hard as, as bones at that point. It becomes that rigid. So we hydrate, soften. We then go on to release and lengthen. And if there's some balancing work to be done, especially between the right and the left side, which is very common, people often have one-sided tightness and one-sided tension in, in their lower back or on one side of their sacroiliac joint, we do some balancing work. And then we go on to strengthen and to bring that into the practice of yoga and everyday activities. So it sounds like a really long process, and it, it is actually amazingly quick. I've seen people in an intensive after doing 15 minutes of sours release burst into tears. And I'll, I'll say, why are you crying? And they'll say, well, that's the first time my sciatica has stopped in six weeks. Mm. Or that's the first time I've felt my, uh, the pain in my SI joint release. And they're blown away because they've been stretching and pulling and doing really extreme yoga practices, trying to get to the source of it. And the gentleness is a really important part of what makes the work work. And part of that is that there are really key neurological connections between the psoas and the nervous system. So if you go at this muscle in an aggressive way, it goes into lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we, I think anyone who's done yoga knows exactly what Don is talking about there. Yeah. The more you pull on it, the more it pulls back. It it is the muscle is the first muscle that contracts when we're in a fight, flight, freeze, or fake it response. Um, and that's why it's being used so much in trauma release work. So because you, if we've had past trauma, uh, if we've had past trauma, there can be a, a long standing residual um, hyper arousal in the sympathetic nervous system that's always there as a vigilant, distrusting um, experience deep in the body. So I, 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 there's so many things I want to say, but. One of like the deep existential anxiety, right? That sense of not being settled in self. Like Mm -hmm. that sense of like the sense of like if our if our first chakra is this this need need to just to be and the and that I deserve to just to be and just to be here, right? If that's if that's traumatized. That there's a sense of like, no, you're not okay be here as, as you are, that you need to be different than you are. Mm. That, that the sense of like that level of, of depth of core of existential beingness, right? If like that's not okay, this gets triggered, then all of a sudden we're we're not actually able to relax into our core. Right. That sense of that softening and that consciousness actually finding being able to travel down, being able to to mm. tap into root, into tribe, into the earth, into right, the ground of yeah. just being well, here. Well, in Eastern cultures, yes, and in Eastern cultures, uh, and especially in Japan, the concept of hara infuses their entire language. So where we might say, ah, oh, it's... Um, he's lost his head or it's all gone into his head, they'll say, ah, his, his, his hara is rising. Or, mm. um, where we might say she has a really good head on her shoulders. They'll say, Hmm, she has a very well descent developed sense of belly. So although mm. in, in this particular book, uh, we're talking about the structure we we also point to this energetic anatomy, which is about a deep, deep sense of well-being, centeredness, connectedness, groundedness. And you will see this in any supreme athlete, any supreme meditator has this energetic centeredness that connects them, not just to themselves, but to the earth and to the space 
around them. It's readily apparent when you meet someone who has this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different operating system. It's a totally different operating system. And I, I, the horses really have taught me a lot about this because I'm not a naturally calm person. I'm very highly strung. I tend to be fearful, um, have a very high vata constitution. So I have to really work at being grounded, staying calm. And with the horses, when you're on their backs, if you go into a flight response and you, you, know, you lift your weight off their back, if, if it's a sensitive horse, it is just going to take off because mm. it's, it's, it's reading the person on my back is afraid. The person on my back doesn't trust the situation and neither do I. And I had a, a horse that um, was very, very difficult. I worked with him for over 10 years and he was a handful. I mean, he could just explode and be incredibly dangerous and it was uh, one of the most satisfying experiences for me to eventually get him to the point where I could take him to a competition. And, um, and, and you know, this is a horse that my, my farrier was afraid of, and he shoes 700 horses a year, and he said, I'm intimidated by your horse. And I remember one competition I, I was entering the, the arena and a train went by, a, a, literally like 50 feet away from the competition arena. A freight train went by. At the same time, a jet plane flew overhead. And then someone decided to drive a truck with a rattling trailer. Uh, a, a few months before that time, any of those things could have caused that horse to completely lose the plot. But I had trained my mind and my being to stay subtle to a really good equestrian coach. And she would tell me to say things like, not a mountain lion. <laughs> it's not a mountain lion. Yeah, whatever is in front of you is not a mountain lion. And to just remain absolutely focused on the task at hand. And he went into that arena as if it was just the most settled situation you could imagine because I was able to stay calm in myself. So there's so much more that we can gain from doing core work than simply having a trim abdomen. <laughs> and uh, uh, I mean, that's nice too. Uh, it's lovely to have a strong back and, and have strong abdominal muscles that can serve you. But the deeper level of what core work can bring is what Patanjali talks about in the Yoga Sutras. So, uh, yeah, let's get into that because I mean, one of the I mean, what I really sense is like the more fluidity we have in our in our nervous system, like the less like bumps and jolts, and the more even steady flow, and the more integrity to our nervous channel, the more grounded we become, the more all the, the sort of the superficial distractions and cravings. Like if we just go to the, if we go back to the waistline, right? Like mm -hmm. what, what's causing mm -hmm. the person to overeat in the first place? Right? Exactly. Like what's, what's causing the person to put in usually more carbs, more sugar, more caffeine, more alcohol, like more of the, the stuff that just, you know, the, the reaching, the cravings, the desires, the addictions that are looking for the sense of well being, right? Like that's maybe what the person's really craving and all these little, distractions right but also well, you, yeah go ahead you you know from you know from the principles of rajas and tamas and sattva that when someone is in the throes of rajas which is that active element if you're imbalanced on that side of the equation rajas wants more rajas yeah. rajas wants to stay up till one in the morning and watch violent movies and and uh, eat stimulating foods. If you're in the throes of Thomas, you're down at the ice cream parlor having your third gelato and you're getting out of bed at the crack of noon and heading <laughs> to the refrigerator to make yourself a stack of pancakes. You know, Thomas wants more Thomas. 
when we're in the middle, when we're in sattva, sattva, sattva wants more sattva. And anyone who's ever had a good introduction to yoga will inevitably start to notice that things just fall away. They don't have to try yeah. uh, hard to stop eating a certain way. Things just fall away because sattva wants more sattva. Patanjali defines asana in the second book on the means of yoga, the 46th sutra. He says, shtira sukham asana. And shtira means steady, steadfast, strong, stable. And sukha, su means good, ka means space, a good space. Really. If you can find this stability, this steadiness of strength it's going to lead to a sense of ease and relaxation so that asanam you can be comfortably seated wherever you find yourself not just in a yoga posture but wherever you find yourself and then he goes on to say in the 47th sutra he says well how how do we do this we do this by focusing the mind on the part of ourselves that is unchanging. And it's often described as like, the cosmic serpent resting on the waters of infinity. And then he gives this amazing gift in the 48th Sutra, because he's kind of like putting a carrot in front of us. It's like, why do I want to do this? Why do I want right. to do this practice? I says, if you do this practice, you'll be liberated from the throes of dualities, meaning the ups and downs, success, failure, pain, pleasure, all of those forces are going to continue to operate because that's what happens in life and in nature. But you're not going to be on that roller coaster anymore because you've trained yourself to stay steady. And that's that's really the purpose of of doing the practice. So if I'm practicing asana with my focus on stability and steadiness and centeredness and i i use that as a constraint a healthy constraint to say i'm only going to extend my body as far as i can within the constraints of this stability then already you have a safety mechanism there if the mind is striving towards some extreme position as if that is the goal of yoga, then we throw stability out, out the window because it's not important to us. When we're in a room of people who are practicing with this focus on steadiness, it's so quiet. It's so calm. The whole room has this mind, this consciousness of the steadiness. If you're in a room with people who are competing there's a tremendous noise and agitation going on because there's strain. It's not leading to equanimity, um, even though it might get you the most likes on your <laughs> Facebook page for your your photograph of of having got your head your your foot behind your head or whatever <laughs> the, the goal is. Oh, yeah. so. Let's go from there. So someone that's had more of a, let's just say the person that's had more of a, a superficial uh, introduction to yoga or practice, and maybe even they're practicing with, you know, with just a lot of distraction, right? Like a lot of music or other people or even chit chat, right? Where there's a lot of, you know, whether the teacher's filling the space with words or, uh, or whatnot, right? Where mm -hmm. there, there's a, there's a lot of distracting environments where yoga is being taught. We'll just put it that way, uh, and practiced at home, right? And now all of a sudden they're like, yeah. "Okay, I want to go." I, I'm often amazed. Yes, I I remember taking a trip to New York, and I went to two different studios. I won't um, say what the one of them was. <laughs> and when I walked in off the street, the atmosphere inside that studio was more jarring than the atmosphere on the street oh, it was just this hubbub of noise and uh every single surface of the walls was covered with with kind of gaudy 
colored murals and there was rock music pounding through the walls. And I, I was just quite dumbstruck um, that this was being offered as a context for practice. And then the following day, because I have a, had a lovely relationship with the Integral Yoga Institute in New York, I went there to just offer a, a free class to all the teachers there because the teachers there for the most part, volunteer their services to the community. And the moment I walked through the door, it was just the sanctuary of calm and stillness within. I thought, oh, this feels so good after being on the street. Um, and it was palpable. So, so yeah, I mean, just try, yeah, tying that into, like, in order f- with, say, the six-step protocol, right? It's like in order to even find it number one there's a prerequisite of 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 quietness and curiosity all right we'll be back with the second half of the show and as we do we're going to get into what yoga sutras 46 through 48 have to do with advancing your core experience as well as tapping into the physical intelligence of your enteric nervous system if you don't know what that's all about you should stay tuned You've done some serious work. You're operating at a higher level of consciousness. You know how to take care of your body. You'd like to up-level other aspects in your life, your space, your time, your dharma, your flow, and your body. Ether, air, fire, water, earth. I'm taking a posse of peeps into the Awake Living course. 50 people will be selected to join this expedition. We're opening the doors to anyone who is feeling great and wants to up-level how they align their life, time optimization, space alignment, hitting goals, wealth expansion, and day-to-day ease. If you're interested in awake living, we have a super fun process for you to experience. Go to yogahealer.com forward slash awake. Sign up for your free awake living coaching session. During your free awake living coaching session, you will refine the next version of you. As a bonus, you'll receive the 60-minute workshop, Insider Scoop, on how I optimize my day as a yoga mom, tribe leader, and social entrepreneur. Go to yogahealer.com forward slash awake and sign up for your free Awake Living coaching session. Yeah, someone recently asked me what I thought about (laughs) classes where yoga and wine pairing and yoga and kegging parties and things like this. And I, I said, well, while it's it it might be just fine to have a glass of wine or beer in a social setting oh, in moderation, and I do. I occasionally enjoy something like that. When people go to a yoga center, they're trying to make a different choice about how they manage their consciousness. They're trying to find another way to handle their mental, emotional body. How strange then if we put alcohol into a yoga studio or if we uh, add lots of distraction and noise in a yoga studio because people are, I mean, they might as well be staying home with a TV on full blast than going to the yoga studio. Yeah. If that's what's being offered within the container of the yoga studio. And I know there are many wonderful centers around the world that offer beautiful space. Uh, and the teachers there offer a wonderful context for people to explore yoga in a, in a much deeper sense of what yoga can be. Your teachers themselves can can do a lot to minimize a sense of competition within their classes. I often, when I'm teaching, I'll I'll praise the person who's choosing to do the simplest variation. It might be someone who's had an injury and they can only come up a few inches away from the floor when they're they're doing something like a cobra. And I'll say, look at you know, look at Susan over here. She's choosing the variation that is going to be the one that heals her back good for you that you you have so much respect for yourself that you're willing to be totally honest with where you are and to use the practice to heal yourself if we're only praising the people who can get their head onto the soles of their feet and i've even heard stories of teachers um 
bringing the whole class around someone who's doing something like that and everyone applauding, that sends a very clear message about what it is that, that students should be aiming for. And that total honesty and authenticity really is is what we're aiming for. And yoga is not dependent on a position. I mean, you can be in a wheelchair and do yoga. It advanced is whatever practice is bringing you closer to the truth of who you really are, yeah. which is eternal. So when people ask me how old I am now, I say, I'm eternal. What about you? (laughs) (laughs) I might be more eternal than you at this point, or you might be less eternal than me, but I don't get my age because I just say, well, who I am, the heart of my being is eternal. Hmm. And that's what we want to connect with. Yeah. Yeah, and so the just this emphasis on uh, collaboration with the self, quiet, and collaborating with a, an environment where we can actually turn our awareness inward to discover and 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 find parts of ourselves, start to connect parts of ourselves. Right? How is this part connected to that part? And the amount of tranquility—that's a prerequisite, right? Whether it's just turning the music off or doing the practice at home and starting to explore within, right. And then starting to notice like how, how's, how's this connected to that? How is one thing relating to another? I'd love for you to describe a bit and creating a system, right. Creating a six step protocol. Like what was part of your, your process and your ahas and your, your quietness, which enables then well, like the next I- evolution. Uh, to be um, to be clear, uh, Leela Stewart really uses that kind of um, codification of uh, a system per se for working with core body, and and I concur that it's it's a very successful way to work with core for. For myself, I tend to work um, within my own practice and with students much more intuitively. Um, And it might be helpful for listeners to just remember that the original yogi was someone like you and me who woke up and felt grumpy, maybe had a headache, perhaps had something going on with them. Uh, health-wise that wasn't so so great the people who practiced yoga thousands of years ago were human beings and the way that these practices have evolved was through that inner referencing of going and investigating and exploring uh finding what movements what practices brought about balance and we're part of that evolution Sometimes people come into the room thinking like big brothers watching them that if they do a movement uh, in any any other way than the prescribed way of their method, that they're some doing something wrong or something subversive. But really, this is an ongoing evolution where we're, we have to become the original yogi to truly do this practice. We can't just play Simon Says and, and copy what the teachers doing in front of the room and think that we're going to arrive with the same realizations that ancient yogis said we we won't we have to dive into that process so for me as a teacher my role really is just to offer the container for people to feel safe enough to go into that inquiry and arrive at their own conclusions that's important they have to be able to say this didn't work for me. And and then we can go into co-inquiry with that. Why didn't it work for me? Maybe there's another way of doing it. You know, I had a student in Madrid who uh, came into the intensive last year who was in a lot of back pain. And as we started to explore it, she noticed that whenever she went into deeper back pains, it, uh, back bends, it got worse. And after a few days, she started to... Uh, modulate the amount of extension in her back, uh, practicing great 
constraint. She saw a huge reduction in the pain in her back. And because of the hypermobility that had developed, I could see that she needed to work that way for maybe a year or three years to rebuild the strength in her back. And I, so I suggested this to her and suggested that doing deep back bends was perhaps not a good idea right now. And her first response was, my teacher's not going to like that. (laughs) Really? Well, and, and then we had to have a discussion around, well, are you doing this practice to please your teacher or are you doing this practice to bring about well-being because I can assure you your teacher doesn't wake up with your back pain right your teacher doesn't wake up with the consequences of the only person who wakes up to the consequence of the practice is you and that's not an uncommon exchange where students by the end of an intensive realize that they truly need to practice in a different way they're arriving in that conclusion themselves and then they'll say I can't go back to regular public classes anymore because to go back is to put myself into a coercive environment where I'm being encouraged to do things that don't feel right. And I'm not even being allowed to do the things that do feel right. Uh, And that's part of the no pain, no gain mythology that is infusing yoga culture now worldwide, where students are being told absolutely absurd, irrational, uh, given irrational instructions that have no basis in science at all, that uh, the way I would compare it would be uh, if, if you were on a medication and it was giving you terrible side effects, terrible debilitating side effects, and you go back to your doctor and the doctor says, well, okay, I think we need to increase that medication. You, you'd be dumbstruck. You'd be, you'd, uh, hopefully you'd be questioning your, your doctor's judgment if they're saying, oh, if you have pain in your shoulder, just do more of the practice that caused the pain. Yeah. Or you need to just work through this pain. Or if, if you can, or spiritualizing the pain. It's part of the practice to be in this deep pain. Uh, from a scientific point of view, your entire body is a matrix of proprioception. It's exquisite. The fascia we now know has something like six times the sensory nerve uh, endings than the muscle, meaning your whole body is infused in fascia. The fascia has this capacity. It's very exciting to be a biomechanical regulatory system telling you where you are, how you are. And pointing to, if we listen to it, pointing to the very best pathway for movement that's available to our structure in the moment that we move. And that's changing all the time. So if awareness is present, we're having to choose different pathways from moment to moment. So when someone says, no pain, no gain, I think, hmm. Pain is the body's way of signaling something's wrong and saying, hey, choose another pathway, choose right. another way to do Go this. the other way. <laughs> Go the other Try way. Try the opposite. If I've got, <laughs> yeah, I've, if I've got blinders on, and the blinders might be a method, uh, if I've got my blinders on, God, well, I'm cordoning off all creative options, all creative solutions, I won't choose a different way. And that's very, very common. I, I, well, because the pattern, I mean, let's talk about this because so much of, so much of unwinding the pain is unwinding the pattern, right? And and getting in the patterns tied up with the fascia is holding the it's like we've got it's holding the muscles in place, it's holding the diaphragm in place, it's, so it's limiting our capacity to to breathe, limiting our capacity therefore to to think, to think new thoughts, to receive right at the core level of inspiration, at inhalation, right? You, and, yes, 
Well, the psoas muscles, uh, they interdigitate with the thoracic diaphragm. So you you can really, I think of the diaphragm and the psoas now as one continuous muscle. If you've got holding in your breath, that's going to pull like a tug of war on the psoas. If you've got holding in your psoas, it's going to pull on your thoracic diaphragm. And so those forces are you know, intimately interwoven in in the body. So with the pattern, right? So what you're saying is like the pattern gets so thick it becomes a blinder, and you can't you can't see, right? You can't see the opposite. You can't. It, is it like you can't even have the thought of what a better <laughs> what a better next course of action may be? What if if you if you don't if you haven't developed the capacity for inner reference, if the first port of call is always the teacher, whenever you have a question, you put your hand up, what should I do? When should I breathe in? When should I breathe out? What did I feel? Those sorts of questions indicate to me that someone hasn't developed this capacity to internalize their inquiry process. And it's so prevalent now that in intensives, I'll encounter someone, say, who is clearly uncomfortable and will engage in a dialogue. I might start by saying, it looks as if you're uncomfortable. And they say, oh, yeah, this really hurts in this position. Mm. And I'll say, well, you've been there for five minutes. Um, <laughs> didn't, did it occur to you that you might try something different? And they'll just look at me as if I'm speaking some other language. What, what do you mean, did it occur to me? Well, what I mean is, did it occur to you that you could maybe experiment by lowering the blanket or changing the angle or asking for help if you weren't sure? And, and then they start to get the sense of, oh, comfort is what, I'm, what I should be seeking. Mm. That if I have a very, very high standard for comfort, which is the opposite of the no pain, no gain paradigm. If I have a high standard for comfort, I start getting interested in bespoke yoga, you know, tailoring the practice so that it, it doesn't just fit like something that you bought from Kmart. It fits you perfectly in the moment. And and then the each posture becomes very sophisticated because you're you're tailoring every every movement so that it's working for your structure beautifully and it fits you well. Uh, yeah. And it, it's something that you want to, to wear, uh, but it's a, it's an ongoing evolutionary process. So what you did yesterday might not be what you do today because your body's changing, you're changing and therefore what you do has to change. And, and if we offer people permission to do this, they, they, develop the capacity very well very quickly to to adapt the practice to their needs yeah yeah i mean it it, it i mean it just goes back to to steer sugasanam right if, when we get steady around ease that steadiness it, it guides us and that ease and like oh this is this is better <laughs> this is good <laughs> this is more good Right. And that becomes more of the operating system that becomes more of the decision maker. Mm. And it's so, I mean, it's, you're speaking so uh, eloquently too, is the, the core return to, to trust. And for many people, it's not even a return because they never had it, right. They weren't raised in a way that honored, they weren't maybe even birthed or carried prenatally in a way that honored their beingness. They weren't maybe raised in a way where they could feel they could feel how they felt. They could mm. they could mm. respond in a safe way and articulate that. So it's like it's learning. It's a new learning. It's a new evolution, right? Of like, oh, okay, wait, I can honor. Oh, that's there's more ease. Oh, that's better. Oh, yeah, and there. Oh, that's good. You know, and they can start yeah, to yeah. have that internal dialogue. Well, we now know that there's a third part to the nervous system, the enteric nervous system, otherwise known as the abdominal brain. And curiously, the knowledge of this nervous system, it, we've known about it scientifically for a long, long time, but 
it had no place within our Western cultural sense of the body. And so it's never really been at the forefront of understanding about the nervous system. But the enteric nervous system, the abdominal brain, infuses the gut. And so when we talk about bringing this integrity to the center, we start tuning in to a deep animal understanding of what's right for us. And everybody's had experiences where they've had a, a, a gut instinct. Uh, and when you learn to trust it, oh, sometimes it can literally save your life learning to trust that gut feeling, even though the cognitive brain hasn't yet kicked in. Now, I live in earthquake country here, and it, it blows me out how I can be in the deepest sleep. And then the next moment, I'm on the floor under my bed in the fetal position because the earth started to, mm. to rock and shake. And somehow my body knew to get me into uh, a position where I might be safer than lying in bed. And it, it's precognitive. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what we're tapping into when we're tapping into the intelligence of that abdominal brain. And there's certainly what Leah would call a psychodynamic stability that occurs when we have more balance, when we have more strength in the core, and when that's connected through to the rest of the body. But it's only something you would understand through a felt experience of it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So and one of the most beautiful things in in the book is the images and how, to me, just how simple they are right oh, you- well um i i think i think kate you'll really uh you'll really enjoy hearing a story of the illustrations because my illustrator what she does for her day job she's a tattoo artist mm, that she has is people, so cool so she, her she has people flying her fabric is skin <laughs> her fabric is the three-dimensional body those illustrations are a very complex process because she would come here every Sunday afternoon for about six months, and I would prepare a package of maybe four or five different perspectives of the particular structure we wanted to represent. And she'd come back with a pencil sketch, and then over the course of about two or three months, we decided that we had to minimize the number of colors. Because when many people see an anatomical illustration that's fully colored, they get confused. Yeah. It's just this. The other thing they get confused about is the 200 labels and the white margins. Um, if you're not trained in medical anatomy, all that information is distracting. So we minimized the information to maximize what it was that we wanted the reader to understand. So they do look very simple. But I can tell you that the process of getting there was really involved. So as a writer, I always think that's my job to do the hard work so the reader doesn't have to do yeah. that hard work. And with the illustrations that Sonia Rooney did, she's so talented. She did the hard work. Or we did the hard work together to make it really easy for the reader to understand. So there's a so there's and, a few and so self in there. Right. I mean, it's self-identify. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you're like, oh, that, okay. Yep. That's the way. Oh no, it's opposite on my body, but I know exactly what that's pointing to, you know? And I know the sensation of that experience of, okay. And now that's what the muscles are doing under, oh, okay. That's what the diaphragm, right. And you just get that like, oh, I see me. I see my pattern. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's not, I mean, there's a few illustr- illustrations in that book. You will not find an illustration of origin and insertion of psoas in any other anatomy book in the world that is that clear because we took the best of the best and and, and we said how could we make it even better and uh, it I I love the process of working with illustrations I learn a lot in fact um, I uh, opened up a clinical text um, once the illustrations were finished and I thought oh my goodness we've made a mistake we've made a mistake. I was looking at this medical text and actually the mistake was in the medical text. <laughs> it, wasn't, it, was, 
wasn't an hour illustration. It was in the medical wow. text. I've learned a great, a great deal. Wow. Uh, but people don't have to go into that much detail to benefit from the book. Um, if you're not into anatomy, you can just like glimpse at the illustrations. You can just glimpse at them, go straight to the practical exercises. And yeah. then if you find benefit, you might get curious and think, oh, maybe, maybe I want to know more about this. Yeah. Anatomy stuff. Yeah. To understand why, why this is working or why this is helping me. Yeah. Or what, what it looks like on the inside, right? Like, what, what, oh, what does my pattern actually look like on that? Muscle? Yeah. What so, it looks like on the inside. Being, being able to visualize it really yeah. is the first step towards being able to sense and feel it. And unfortunately mm. for many of us in our education, we arrive graduating from high school without having un any understanding of the body that we live in. It's purely theoretical. And even going into university, I've done full kinesiology courses where the lecturer stood behind a lectern for 12 weeks. Yeah. We didn't move from our seats. It was all theory. So experiential anatomy, which Leela is so good at teaching and so many of the wonderful inquiries in the book are from, from her work clinically, is making that anatomy a, a felt, direct experience in your body and it's it's tremendously empowering to get to know the geography that is you <laughs> yeah yeah and i'm sure everyone can relate to like yeah the education without the experience is it doesn't stick and there's not a lasting value so in, you know just in closing because i want to respect your time that the the other part of the, just the, the simplicity of the exercises and the photos right mm. where where Often, I mean, I've had a lot of yoga training and therapeutics and, and whatnot, and there's there's things I recognize in uh, from my own training, and then there's and then there's other other things I don't, which are great. But what, one thing that just really stands out, I think, especially to people who are like, yeah, wait, what is the sort of like the lost horizon of my core, of my breath, of my ground of being? And to see the the photo, like the the sort of the, the what to do to put yourself together at the next level, at the next operating system, and just how quiet and simple in in one way, right? And then how you know, of like the the like the what to do is the, the the opposite of what you're talking about with like the Facebook and the Instagram, but behind uh, the head uh, photo, right? It's like it's the yeah. we're going to way to the other side of the spectrum, so you can actually get in and feel and breathe and unwind and those activities to do that are so they're just even quieting to look at the images yes and and the person who modeled the i mean i did some of the modeling but i wanted to be free to technically spot the photographs carla brody is a long time student of mine she flew down from auckland and she totally embodies this cohesion and also the stillness in herself. So mm. when you look at the photograph, you're not just seeing her in a physical position, you're seeing where she is in her consciousness, which is calm. And that's why when we look at an image like that, we, we literally feel calm yeah. seeing it yeah. because it's expressing calm. Um, I'm very grateful for for her help and uh it's it's been fantastic to have such a great team to create this book and make it available to people worldwide and if the listeners um uh, want to get a little sneak preview they can click on the free resources uh link uh from the podcast and download two chapters of the book uh in the the chapters we've chosen are the introduction and the third chapter which has all the foundation practices so they can immediately start working with some of the positions that uh, allow release and links through the deep core muscles of the body so generous thank you so much for you're first welcome. All, putting out the book and then being on be, getting out and i'm so glad donna that you're you're uh you're here and your voice is now just more more out there and your work is more accessible and that you're more accessible and that you're sharing these chapters. It's a, well, it's just profound. I'm, so, I'm so psyched to dive in deeper into the book and into my practice. And I, I've heard so much from our last podcast, uh, which 
instantly like went to the top of like number of downloads. It was awesome. Like the world is so ready to hear you and to, and to dive deep into what you know. So, so thank you for all well, you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for, for offering me the space to share the information. And, and I want to just to share with the listeners that this is my first self publishing venture. Um, after uh, publishing four books through major publishers. So I respect my publishers and so grateful to my agent and my all the skillful editors that have helped me over the years. I, but I felt that I could no longer um, live with 7% or whatever it is that I get for the labor, that huge investment that is a book. And so I'm, I'm really, uh, my partner and I have started Embodied Wisdom Publishing to uh, to launch this this book, and we do need all the help we can get to kind of change the game, um, so that content creators like myself and others who we hope to bring on board can receive like a a better share of the wealth. Uh, I guess the equivalent of fair trade, really. Um, when you buy coffee, that you know the workers get paid uh, uh, fairly for producing those coffee beans, um, you feel better about getting the product. So we're trying to change um, that situation, both for writers and, and for other content providers, whether it's online material. And I don't know, we, we might be uh, licking our wounds 18 months from now. Who no, knows? But we're, no. We're, we're, we're going to take the chance and see, <laughs> see how, how we go. And um, I'm tremendously thankful to my partner, Nick Little, for the support in doing all the, the, the work behind the scenes to make it possible. Awesome. Well, great. Well, I'm so, I'm so glad that, uh, that we had a chance to, to really tell people a bit about what, you know, just really what's going on behind back pain. And so you guys get, get bath pathways to a centered body. It's uh it's, it's so worth it. Oh, yay. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening. And Donna, thanks for being here. It's so cool. Donna invited me to go to her retreat in Austin, Texas this summer. So I will be there or be square uh, and actually hit the mat for five days. I'm so excited to, to go to, to go and uh, spend some time with her and, and her beloved. Uh, let's see. Next up on the Yoga Healer Real Life Show. You can hear me clicking on my computer. Who is up next? Ali Van Fossen of the Journey Junkie. Ali's She's a cool chick. I, I'm going to be talking more with her. She's a marketing genius. So she's coming on the Dharma and Dollar show. She's just about to leave her life on land and uh, set, set sail with, with her, uh, sig- her husband, her significant other. And, uh, and she talks a lot about in that, in that show, just about, about taking the leap and living your dreams. It's a good show. And then in next Monday, we have Tiffany Cruikshank of yogamedicine.com. I, I don't know if Tiffany needs any introduction to you. If you're into the yoga world, she probably doesn't. Uh, she knows a lot about yoga, Chinese medicine, sports medicine, and teaching yoga. And it's a, it's a fun connection that we have on that show. All right. Thanks for listening. And just remember, if you haven't checked out the Awake series where I get into your seven capacities, seven chakras, it's all free. You should. It's at yogahealer.com forward slash awake only for a limited time. Yoga Healer Real Life Show with Kate Stillman. Yoga Healer.